Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for The Roltex, an episode of Mask produced by Deke. Now, Mask, one of my favourite cartoons of all time. I still watch it to this day quite frequently. Something about it, helped by an absolutely incredible theme song by Shooky Levy. I mean, Shooky Levy in the 1980s. He really just did dominate, didn't he? When you think about all the theme songs he did, from Ulysses 31 to Jason the World Warriors, Mask, Inspector Gadget, He-Man, She-Ra, the list is endless. I mean, it literally is an endless list. And yeah, I mean, it's one of those theme songs that instantly gets you pumped up for the, for the series. Funnily enough, I would say that the introduction sequence visually isn't as strong as many of the episodes. It's good, but if you look at the end credits, the animation used under the text is from the roughly three minute pilot that was created to sell the series. And the staging and direction and the animation in the pilot is fantastic. And it's such a shame that that wasn't used as the opening titles, because I think edited right, it's far stronger than this introduction sequence that we ended up with. Not that it's a bad introduction sequence, it's just not as good as I think it could be. Especially with some of the Japanese studios that worked on Mask with their level of fantastic animation. Oh, I don't think it's working. That's because you're probably scaring all the birds away. Yeah, Scott Tracker, so Brennan Thicke, obviously son of Alan Thicke, is the voice of Scott Tracker. And I always thought he was a great voice actor in this series. He would also play Dennis in the Dennis the Menace cartoon as well, produced by Deke. I think he's a fantastic voice actor. Often a lot of the 80s sidekicks like your Orcos, your Snarfs, your T-Bobs and Scott Trackers always get unfairly disparaged by experts. But I thought Scott Tracker and T-Bob in this series for the most part, really served a purpose. Why don't you take a break? The hot dogs are almost ready. Gee, now I know how a scarecrow feels. And if you listen to Graham McKenna's voice as T-Bob in this episode, it's a much lower register. It's more like down here. It was, a, it was a much lower register for the character, which kind of suggests to me this is one of the earlier episodes recorded, produced. And yeah, it's early in the series. It's episode eight, I believe. But I think that this would have been one of the earliest ones recorded where they were just trying to find the voices of certain characters. And later in this episode, obviously, Miles Mayhem shows up and you'll hear that Brendan McCain, the voice actor, is trying to find his voice for that character as well. It strikes me as this was very early in the recording sessions. Also, Scott's bird calling device that we see in this opening scene showcases that he's a young genius. It's actually stated in numerous episodes that he built T-Bob from loads of different parts, but he built and created artificial intelligence. So he's a boy genius. The fact that he built T-Bob also leads to some good comedy throughout the series where if T-Bob loses at a game they're playing, he's like, well, I've obviously been programmed to lose. <laughs> And as for T-Bob, I bloody love the character. I've always thought he was a great addition to this show. I'm sure you could write a book with just his puns. But he's a great character. He's a genuinely funny sidekick. And you can't say that for all the sidekicks. But I think T-Bob is actually funny. I don't know if it's the voice. I don't know if it's the, the design, the mannerisms. I mean, some of the Japanese studios that work on certain episodes really go to town with T-Bob. And it's fantastic to watch him move and work and everything. This is a great premise for an episode, as it's not simply the bad guys sending the Rotex, as is explained by Dwayne Kennedy. They're actually a special breed of metal-eating insect created by the US military for warfare. However, as we see in the real world, a weapon was misplaced and ended up in the hands of the bad guys. It's, it's a great idea for a plot. I mean, Mask episodes always had really decent plots. There was always conspiracies, and it wasn't just like, we've got this, we need to get this back, or someone's been kidnapped. It was, Mask was never about that. It was always about Venom were a terrorist organization trying to gain power, whether it be in this country or that country or that government or this. There was a lot of political ambition going on with Venom as well. It, it was so fantastic. Priority one emergency. Select the best mask agents for this mission. Confirmed. In these early episodes, the computer would often summon pretty much all of the mask agents. But as the first season progressed and new characters were introduced, the reliance on a large group dwindled until, on occasion, the computer would select two mask agents. And one of those was like Bruce Sato, who was sat next to him in the passenger seat. So, yeah. The idea of a computer display with such advanced graphics as well. The presentation of this one is actually a little different to most summoning of mask agent sequences where we see a grid on the screen often it's just a blank screen with the computer generated imagery i always love these cutaways to the mask agents in their civilian lives some of the beautifully animated episodes have some wonderful 
wonderful sequences. There's one with Gloria Baker in a race. It's so good. I mean, the animation of that is almost like the best in the episode, and it's just a cutaway, but it's so, so good. Uh, excuse me. What? Buddy Hawk. This cutaway to Matt is interesting, why he's sat summoning Buddy Hawks. It always makes me smile because it breaks up the cyclical nature of this scene, where it's one agent after the other. We kind of get this, the camera pulls back and we see Matt at his computer summoning the agents. <laughs> I always remember I knew I was getting old when I saw in the uh, Mask UK annual published by Grand Dreams. I owned it as a kid, I picked it up many years later, probably in my early 30s. I knew I was getting old when Matt Tracker's profile said that he was 28 years old. I was at 28 and he's the leader of Mask. I think at 28 years old I barely accomplished anything. <laughs> oh, it's funny, go back and look at that shot of them all around the table. Matt Tracker is in his Spectrum uniform, but he's painted as if he's wearing his Ultra Flash gear. That's why we're bringing these plastic boxes along to contain them. Yeah, well, you're the animal nut, Alex, not me. The funny thing about this episode is that to look at, it's visually strong. I remember it being in one of the Panini sticker albums, I think the one to the European markets. And individually, when you see these shots, great looking episode. But not all the animation throughout is particularly good. There is, of course, one outstanding scene in this episode, but we'll get to that later on. You know, as a writer for this cartoon, I'm sure you had to be slightly skilled in the way you wrote the script. Specifically with regards to the selection of the mask agents you had chosen? Of course, I'm sure the writers would plan in advance, but a mistake in character selection could take away the threat of any perils they may face. Think about it, you could never really put the heroes in any danger like a spiked wall of death, because so-and-so's mask, Buddy Hawks for example, could enable them to all walk through that spiked wall. <laughs> Actually, that said, I'm sure if we were to look at all the perilous situations that the mask agents find themselves in, we'd probably find numerous examples of a mask agent not using their mask's abilities in situations in which they absolutely could and should do. Chucky Levy's music is just so, it just sets the mood so perfectly. Yeah, buggy, buggy, buggy. I got a nice piece of aluminum for you. I'm starting to feel like a fool doing this. <laughs> I always love these, these scenes of the highly trained, accomplished mask agents looking for insects. <laughs> And it, there's a great moment coming up here when Alex Sector is about to make a, a declaration to his fellow agents. We see Bruce Sato in the foreground. The camera just zooms into Alex. Boosh, look at that, straight in. Gentlemen, we have met the enemy. We're on our way. Um, but yeah, Matt, Matt Track is about to find out that uh, Thunderhawk may have been compromised by the Rotex. I mentioned before that the animation seems to be a mix of both really good and somewhat average throughout this episode. In this sequence here, in which Matt Tracker and Thunderhawk plummet to the ground, be sure to look at the use of angles, especially here, that's a great low angle. There are some really lovely shots that enable the scene to flow. Bizarre fact, when I was a kid, and actually for quite a long time after, I assumed that the Rotex were made of metal themselves, like little evil robotic bugs somehow forgetting that this would mean that the Rotex would eat one another. So far we've got ten of the little blighters. <laughs> I love this shot, the way you'll see Buddy Hawks resting his arm with his hand on his chin and Hondo just holds up the steering wheel like, whoa! -oh. Come here you, you metal choppers! I take back everything I said. The other thing is about this series, what I always liked, is when the mask agents would stand there talking, it always felt like they were a unit, like a team. It wasn't just like a bunch of individuals just spouting off expositional dialogue. It was, how are we going to solve this problem? And at this point, they don't know Venom's involved. So it's, um, yeah, it's like this weird thing that's happening and they need to solve it. Also here we get to see uh, Rhino Detach, which is a very rare occurrence. Also, this, this vehicle has a great deal of speed. Oh, <laughs> not in that shot. You'll see it in another shot where it, uh, it takes off with some flight. 
I still remember watching the first episode of Mask on a show called The Wide Awake Club. Obviously, the first episode of the series is The Death Stone. They showed The Death Stone, split it up into two acts across the, the show. And, yeah, I remember just falling in love with it straight away. I remember going to our local toy shop, Jennings, and buying my first ever Mask figure and vehicle, which was Condor with Brad Turner, which I think was a lot of people's entry point into the Mask toy line, because I think it's one of the less expensive toys, put it that way. And my dear friend from my youth, Roger Evans, he would come round on a Saturday, every Saturday without fail, and we would sit there. He would bring his mask toys round. He had Bruno Shepard and Scorpion before me. It was like, wow, I would have my mask toys in place. We would have these huge battles. The funny thing was, though, because you're playing with toys, you kind of want to put yourself in those roles. So my character was Matt Tracker. Matt Tracker was now James Etog and Jacques Lafleur was now Roger Evans. And if you look at me as a kid, I was no Matt Tracker. I look more like Nash Gorey. For those who appreciate a no mask, they will get that. I was like a little kid with big glasses, skinny, and it was just, I did not look like the handsome chiseled jawed Matt Tracker. Not that I even look like him now, but you know, back then in the eighties, definitely not Matt Tracker. And so, yeah, the heroes beat a hasty retreat as we head for an act break. Act two here opens up with some really nice animation. Not initially, but you, you'll see it in the way the lasers are animated. Even that shot there of Miles Mayhem. It's always funny when, you know, the talent of voice actors where you've got Brendan McCain voicing Alex Sector, but also Miles Mayhem. He would also voice Jacques Lafleur, the French Canadian as well. And the voices, you know, unless you sit there and really listen, you just don't know they're the same voice actor. It was an incredibly talented voice cast directed by Marsha Goodman. The funny thing about the Condor toy was that on screen it looked really cool, but in, the actual toy was huge. So it looked like a tiny man riding a giant motorbike. I mean, it works, don't get me wrong. It's like, oh, it's such a cool toy, but it was a weird size thing going on. <laughs> The funny thing about Mask as well is quite often in the series, vehicles were trashed. The Thunderhawk got damaged numerous times and uh, so much so vehicles get destroyed that Hondo McLean's Firecracker is written off and they replace it with Night Stalker, which would be renamed Hurricane. And it's crazy that they would just, you know, yes, characters had more than one vehicle as the toy line went on. But yeah, some cartoons of the time would very much protect the vehicles especially you know mask was based on a toy line this was made to sell toys you know i'll always argue that writers weren't trying to sell toys they were trying to tell good stories regardless of the cynical nature of some of these shows being created kenner were obviously like yeah you can trash our cars because you'll have thunderhawk in the next episode right yeah yeah sure we will <laughs> i'm afraid matt old boy that an orderly retreat is in order we're gonna have to come up with something and fast. The road techs begin attacking the mass vehicles and now it's like, uh-oh, masks are in trouble and they know it. But they do something here very clever. It's like, okay, well, let's play Venom at their own game. As, as Matt says, they want the road techs? Let's give them the road techs. Bruce, dear Bruce, lift up. On. Keep the bug bomb. The brilliance in the writing of this episode is the showcasing of how unstoppable the Rotex are. You get a real sense that no one is truly safe from either Mask or Venom, as we see them wreck Venom vehicles as the episode goes on. And now we get to see how much control Miles Mayhem has over the Rotex. Although there's one thing that just is rather problematic for me. He's using a device there as a homing beacon. Surely the Rotex would just eat that device. <laughs> I do like this shot of the, again, highly skilled, trained mask agents swatting insects. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of creepy crawlies either, so I kind of share Sly Rax's displeasure in this scene. But yeah, we can see that there are seemingly hundreds of Rotex, although, yeah, I don't know how they all fit in that box. I do like that moment. He shakes off a couple of Rotex, but surely with the hundreds that just went into that box, they would have demolished that control device in seconds. And now we see Mayhem take to the air. And he does a little broadcast here over the microphone and loudspeaker of Switchblade, which I highly doubt was mentioned in the toy manual. <laughs> That would have been a cool feature. And what a villain just goes off laughing. Little do they know, Matt Tracker's son and his bird calling device will solve all of their problems. The other thing about the mask agents is you always felt that they were friends outside of their mission to save the world. In certain episodes, you would see the heroes holidaying with one another. So that was always quite interesting. 
alas, it also happened that whilst they were on holiday, they would always encounter Venom in whatever country they happened to be in. Of all the luck. Here we see Scott Tracker has the playroom of a rich kid. <laughs> That's huge. He's got a pool table, he's got everything. There's a great shot coming up you'll see of Matt Tracker and Alex Sector just sitting talking. The way they're illustrated looks very real. Again, like I said before, it just it feels it doesn't feel like expositional. It's characters trying to figure out how to solve the problem. The trick isn't finding the same frequency mayhem's using to control them. Just very real, very real body language as well. Very real body language in this shot. Although Matt Tracker's uniform is incorrectly coloured in places there, unfortunately. Well, Matt, he's either going to get her to fly or blow us all up. Our spy in the laboratory left the Rotex at precisely the correct coordinates. So yeah, here we are with the agents of Venom. Let's just listen to Sly Rax for a second. I hate them bugs. They eat natural. I think the road decks give old cold-blooded racks the creepy crawlies. Shut up, dagger. I should mention Mark Halloran as, as a voice actor here in this scene. He's voicing both Cliff Dagger and Sly Rax, which are the two prominent henchmen in the Venom squad. But his Cliff Dagger in this episode, again, much like the other voices I mentioned, definitely still trying to find the character, trying to find the voice. So yeah, it's funny, when I was a kid, I didn't know who Jack Nicholson was. Like, my first real experience, knowledge of Jack Nicholson was when my father and I went to see Batman at the cinema in 1989, August of 89. So, oh, Jack Nicholson plays the Joker. It wasn't until years later, I was watching Mask and I realised, oh my goodness, Mark Halloran is doing a Jack Nicholson impression for Sly Rax. Not only that, if you search on YouTube, you will find an amazing clip of Mark Halloran on a TV talent show doing his Jack Nicholson voice. And it's amazing because it's like, oh, wow, that's Sly Rax. That's him doing the voice. And it's, it's, it's great. It's such a great choice as well. But it's something I just never picked up on as a kid. Look at that. And we get a call back to the old man. There he is. Vehicle races past. He's not too pleased. Great state. Look at that direction as well. We're over the shoulder of Miles Mayhem. We can see Thunderhawk and we can see Sly Rax and Piranha. Amazing direction. And you could tell the episodes that put the effort in because we would see exterior shots of Switchblade's cockpit and we would see Miles Mayhem all different shades of red. That's when you knew the animators and directors were, were putting the putting the work in. So yeah, Matt's trying to awaken the road techs in Mayhem's possession. It's a great piece of animation coming. So this is the one piece of animation I mentioned earlier in the episode. This piece is really nice with Matt in Thunderhawk trying to chase down Mayhem in Switchblade. Really good animation. But the callback to the start of the episode with Scott's bird caller being the best way to activate the road techs is such a great idea. Of course, the only problem with this scene is that Mask have to know for certain that Mayhem is in possession of the Rotex. For all Masks know, he could have dropped them off with some enemy power or could have unleashed them somewhere. So yeah, at the start of this commentary, I mentioned that there is one piece of animation in this episode which is utterly fantastic. Beautiful angle of Sly Rax firing at Thunderhawk. Now watch the animation as Thunderhawk goes down. You know, Matt Track is fighting to gain some control over his vehicle. Watch this. I love the way the camera just keeps pulling away as well. It's such great animation because that's all cell based. There may be a few looped sequences there of the mountains going by, but for the most part, each of those frames is unique and it's just a fantastic piece of animation. It's so detailed and so it has a real weight to it. You get a sense that Thunderhawk is on this crash and burn run and then it, when it flips at the end, you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> you. You're not alive. There's also a lot of mystery in this series about whether or not Scott is Matt's biological son. Some of the 1980s mask canons say yes, whereas others say that Scott is actually adopted. Because the funny thing about Mask is that there were two canons that ran parallel with one another during the height of its popularity. There's the canon seen in the printed material, the comics, the books, etc., that dictates that the agents of Mask and Venom are well aware of one another's identities, and that Miles Mayhem was an important part of creating Mask in the first place. 
However, in the cartoon, that is simply not the case, and the Venom agents have no idea as to the identity of the mask agents. Of course, this would all randomly change in season two of the cartoon when the story appeared to adapt certain elements of the printed material. Specifically, that the Venom agents were now well aware of the names and identities of the mask agents. And in the episode for One Shining Moment, Matt Tracker even states that Miles Mayhem was responsible for helping to create Mask in the first place. Venom must have just had amnesia during that entire first season. Yeah, it's bizarre. I like the way Switchblade like comically crashes here and Mayhem just runs out like he wasn't injured in the slightest. Actually, that is one thing that would happen as the first season went on. The Venom agents would flee the battle in some rather comical situations, even here with Jackhammer, the way it just drives off quite comically. My favourite being from the end of the episode The Manakara Giant with Miles Mayhem and Vanessa Warfield casually flying through the air with not a single scratch on them, even though they've just been involved in a huge explosion. Yeah, another thing, you know, I talked earlier about the vehicles being destroyed in numerous episodes. Here we see Matt Tracker's Spectrum Mask seemingly destroyed forever. Until they build another one, just in time for the next episode, I'm sure. Wow. And Scott and T-Bob, as always, delivering the PSA. It's actually quite fascinating. Scott and T-Bob were seemingly removed from the cast of Season 2, the infamous racing season. I say infamous, I actually really love it. And Scott and T-Bob would only ever show up in PSAs. And even then, briefly, from what my computer brain remembers, T-Bob doesn't even utter a word in any of those PSAs. So another weird thing about the Season 2 PSAs were the inclusion of villains delivering PSAs. But yeah, going through Zen credits, there's some fantastic names that at some point I need to break down and explore with, with you guys on this channel. And yes, that is Chuck Lorre's name in the end credits. For those that don't know, Chuck Lorre wrote the theme song to Ninja Turtles, but I think that's widely known in pop culture these days. So yeah, I mentioned before that when Mask initially aired in the UK, it was shown on the Wide Awake Club. And because of time restrictions, they would never show the PSAs or the end credits. So it wasn't until I purchased an official Mask VHS release that I actually saw the end credits. Also in the UK we had two VHS releases, Mask the Movie 1 and Mask the Movie 2. I'll talk about those in another video at some point. And that's the end of this commentary. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one. Oh and before I finish, one more message. T-Bob is awesome. Let it be said. T-Bob rules.